However, there's something that's what would be unmistakable to me, and that would be the reality that, listen, that's, I feel comfortable with that for me, but I would have nothing to base that on as far as imposing that on someone else. And Yes, well, Christians certainly don't seem to have any problem with imposing their supposedly God-given morality onto other people, despite the fact that they can't even begin to demonstrate the existence of this God, or that this God is, in fact, the source of morality. But the truth is that, generally speaking, atheists do not, in fact, attempt to impose their morality onto other people. You have to understand that one's moral worldview extends well beyond the scope of one's legal notions one's ideas of, of justice and jurisprudence. The atheist's notion of law and, and justice is built on the principle of self-defense. If you set out to harm another person, that person is entitled to defend themselves. If you set out to harm society, society is entitled to defend itself against your harm. In other words, if I didn't feel that way, if I was a person that said, listen, screw your morality... Okay, I'm not, I'm not hindered by your conscience. I feel very comfortable living how I feel. It's all about me. Okay. It's all about me and my pleasure. That's what I'm living for. If I want to take pleasure from someone else, take someone's possessions, take someone, uh, take, <laughs> take a person's life, I can do that. And you, there's nothing, t there's nothing you can say that tell tells me that I'm wrong. Now, one Actually, my personal morality entitles me to tell you that you are wrong. You're just not obligated to agree. But my right to self-defense entitles me to take action against your harmful behavior, regardless of how anyone feels about it morally. Now, one will object. They'll say, no, no, no. No, there are society, there are uh, constructs that are put in place by society. We do these things, we operate on, on these moral standards as a society. And if a person does those things, there are prices to be paid. And once again, there's nothing, there's nothing objective to support that. Uh, a person could very well say, and there are people, by the way, this is not theoretical. There are people that will say, again, screw you. I'm an anarchist. Your society. I want to free myself from your idea of society, your idea of morality. I can do whatever I want. Unfortunately for the person that holds that kind of viewpoint, they don't have any logical recourse to a society that takes action to limit or prevent their behavior. They dispense with any ability to have logical recourse by espousing the very view, I can do whatever I want. And there isn't a thing that you can do objectively to tell me that I'm wrong. And I don't need anything objective to either tell you that you are wrong or take action against your behavior. Your very own philosophy legitimizes my actions. And if my actions are based in self-defense, then they are automatically legitimate. And you know, that is a reality. And I believe that if an atheist is uh, is honest about it, intellectually honest, they're going to have to say, you know what, John, you're right. That, that No, I think they'd actually have to say, you have no idea what you're talking about. And there's another uh, philosophical problem. It's a huge philosoph philosophical problem. How big is it, John? Huge. And this is something that I think a lot of people fail to realize, and it has to do with atheistic evolution. What kind of evolution? Atheistic evolution. What in God's name is atheistic evolution? Okay, and I choose my terms carefully. Actually, no, John, you don't choose your words as carefully as you imagine that you do. And I think I've demonstrated that already in this video. There's atheistic evolution and then there's theistic evolution. I know theists who are evolutionists, okay, and this would not apply to them. The distinction you're trying to make here is absolute nonsense. Evolution is a scientific theory. A person's specific metaphysical ideas are completely irrelevant to that theory. There's no such thing as atheistic and theistic evolution. There's absolutely no reason to apply a metaphysical epithet to evolution. Evolutionary theory is the same theory for you, whether you're a theist or an atheist. But atheistic evolution, there is a unmistakable uh, racist element to atheistic evolution. And once again, I'd like to clarify, I am not equating atheism with racism. I would not. There are many atheists who are not racist. Just many as opposed to most. Okay. But you know what's funny, John? In my personal life experience and in my reading of history, which I'm fast beginning to think is vastly superior to yours, the one thing I've noticed is that racism tends to be an attribute expressed by your crowd, the theists.
Indeed, when you think about where this propensity might have come from, you don't have to look any further than God himself, who very early on began attributing relative value and worth to different human tribes. I guess he just wanted to lead by example. However, uh, there's not a real good reason to think that. And the reason I say that is because uh, objectively speaking, atheistic evolution, by necessity, you know, there are certain races that simply, clearly, have not evolved as highly as, as other races. John, you're talking about a mode of interpreting evolutionary theory that has not existed for many decades now, other than in the minds of ignorant theists who haven't the first clue about the reality of contemporary evolutionary theory. No one talks in terms of higher evolution. Evolution is not about higher, it's about different. It's about diversity. Now the fact is there does exist microevolutionary diversity within the human species, just as there exists such microevolutionary diversity in, say, something like dogs. And it's simply a fact that aspects of that microevolutionary diversity can be placed within certain parameters that involve judgments of superior and inferior. For example, you will never see a pygmy playing for the Harlem Globetrotters. There's a reason that most of the best 100-metre sprinters in the world are Negroid, just as there's a reason that you will almost never see Negroid peoples in an Olympic swimming pool. Now, these are all relatively trivial differences, of course, but the differences exist. When it comes to something perhaps more significant like intelligence, there's no real evidence that any diversity of any significance actually exists although there are very small differences that have been identified, such as in the case of the Ashkenazi Jews, who appear to perform better um, in terms of things like IQ tests than anybody else. But the truth is we don't know whether that is simply an artefact of culture or not. But the truth is microevolutionary differences exist within species, but this is not something that you interpret as a higher or lower form of evolution. And, you know, the evidence of this has been seen is as recent as recent as the early 1900s, where, and you can look this up, this is not some kind of propaganda that I'm putting out here. Um, in 1906, I think it was, there was a, a pygmy, a pygmy from the Congo in the New York Zoo. Now, let's think about this. I'm going to speak, naturally speaking, from an atheistic evolutionary standpoint. Pygmies, okay, from the Congo, and the Aborigines from Australia. Listen, they are just simply not as evolved as, as other breeds of humans. John, do you realize who it was who predominantly interpreted evolutionary theory that way? Who used that interpretation of evolutionary theory to justify their pre-existing prejudices? Again, it was your crowd, theists. Was it atheists that owned the New York Zoo, John? Was it atheists that predominantly trudged through and had a look at the funny little pygmy? These forms of behavior and attitude have got nothing to do with evolution. They've got to do with the mindset that already exists that chooses to interpret evolutionary theory in a particular way, so as to reinforce the content of that pre-existing mindset. You know, when Charles Darwin himself stepped aboard the Beagle, he was a fundamentalist Christian. He was a scriptural literalist who believed in the absolute fixity of species. All of Darwin's sensibilities came out of a Christian culture. All of his modes of expression, his rhetorical devices, his cultural judgments, were all products of his Christian upbringing and conditioning. When various Aboriginal peoples were described as savages, that was a product of Christian culture. Think about that and get back to me. Bye for now. Thanks for watching.